Hey, I'm Tony. This is Long Story Short. And I'm dying. No, really, I am. And so are you. Because even if there's not some unknown disease growing within me or some really bad luck around the corner, we're both still aging. Uh, another year just passed. And I know that that's a really blunt way to kick this topic off, but death, at least for now, is just a part of life. Specifically, it's the part where the biological machines that are our bodies break down. It's really a shame. People, for the most part, love life. It's full of sensations and thoughts and feelings and experiences. Death doesn't have any of those. For that very reason, it can be quite terrifying to some. Many religions and spiritual thinkers have tried to offer answers as to what death is like and what, if anything, comes after. But those accounts are unconfirmed. The only thing dead people do to let us know about what's going on is, well, rot. Sometimes it makes noises because of the rot, but it's not pretty. So, based on what we do know and what we can measure, what exactly happens when you die? I mean, it's gonna happen to all of us. What happens when the thing that is you crumbles? When the stuff that makes a person a person can no longer keep itself together? Today, on Long Story Short, we're talking about what happens when you die. Right off the bat, there are too many ways to die for us to analyze all of them. So let's just talk about the most standard kind of death we can think of. For this ideal death, we're assuming no gunshots or other trauma or other physiological pathologies that could affect the death process post-mortem. Nope, we're assuming that somebody was fine one minute and the next, they're dead. Hey, it happens. To start with, some things you all are probably more familiar with, there are three major criteria that doctors use to determine death in a person. One of the first is when you stop breathing. You've been breathing your whole life, and not for no reason. It's a crucial step in how your body powers its cells. I mentioned this in my video on peak oil theory in the context of a metaphor, but it bears repeating here. If we can't extract oxygen from the atmosphere, we can't create adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and we can't power the cells in our bodies. Your body is a complex machine, and it needs energy to function. It's that simple. I mean, it's also really complicated, but you, you get the gist. Not breathing will help you die in another way too, though. If you're not breathing out CO2, it starts to build up in your blood. This makes it more acidic. Without getting into the chemistry of your blood, having acid blood is not good. If your lack of breathing isn't because you're dead already, it will be soon. The second major criteria governing when somebody is dead is when their heartbeat stops. This is much much worse than if somebody simply stops breathing. The heart is constantly beating every hour of every day, constantly circulating blood through the body. I cannot understate how important this is for maintaining your existence. Blood, among other functions, transports nutrients and metabolic waste through the bloodstream. It's basically the postal service and garbage disposal of the body all rolled up into one. If nutrients can't get to cells, those cells can't repair themselves, create more cells, or even perform whatever their basic function is. If cellular waste products pile up in the cell with no circulating blood to take it away, they too impede the function of the cells. This happens very, very fast because your body needs a lot of this maintenance on a cellular level. If you stop breathing, you've got minutes. Your heart stops. Well, it depends, but it's probably seconds. Now, if somebody stops breathing, we can sometimes restart it with medicine. Same thing goes for when the heart stops. Doctors have actually gotten pretty good at restarting hearts, given the right equipment and enough time. But the third and most interesting measurement of death has much more to do with you. 
then that's right, I'm talking to you, the brain. That's not how you think of yourself, but if there's one part of your body that you can't live without, it's your brain. Your body can live without much of your brain, but you, the person, you need that. So when the brain goes, that's usually it. Lots of things can start the process of death, but your brain usually fails after a period of oxygen deprivation due to the stopped breathing and heart rate. The process isn't immediate. Your brain will put up a hell of a fight, but it doesn't take long either. Just a matter of minutes. As these cells fail, the effects on you are catastrophic. No more central nervous system functioning means no more nerve impulses can be generated. Your muscles may not be dead yet, but you can't get any messages to them. You're not moving anymore if your brain dies. Messages going the other way stop too. Sensory information transmitted along nerve pathways can no longer reach the brain. This basically means that you can no longer feel any sensation, either from the environment or from your own body. Temperature, light, hunger, excitement, pain, all of these sensations and more are gone. But as the brain continues to starve and then does, you will lose far more than sensation and control. Your brain is basically a big network of neurons that communicate using electrical signals. You, intelligence, all that fun stuff, emerges from those countless little interactions. If those neurons stop firing, your brain stops communicating with itself. The parts of your brain that record things aren't. You can no longer make new memories, and even if you could, the information they are made of, worldly sensations, that stuff's no longer coming in. Well, what about memories from the past? Well, to access them, your brain would have to work, and it would need energy, and it doesn't work because it ran out. And the moment it ran out, the whole system started to crumble. If your life, your memories, everything about you were some, I don't know, watercolor painting, brain death is the part where that painting gets dropped in a puddle. Everything fades very quickly, and before long, it's just mush. I hope somebody took a picture. And that's it. You're gone. Hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to reiterate that I'm not discounting the idea of an afterlife or heaven or anything like that. It's not my place to tell you what to believe. Not only because that's a can of worms I'd rather not open, but also because there's just a lot we don't yet know about consciousness. I'll come back to crush dreams when we have a better idea of what that stuff is. What I will say, with conviction, is that once your central nervous system kicks it, your body is meat, and you are not there. And that's a good thing, because you definitely don't want to see what comes next. As soon as a person dies and their body becomes a corpse, they are no longer able to effectively regulate their temperature. So they cool down or heat up to match whatever temperature their environment is. At this point, next to nothing is working anymore. Since the cardiovascular and lymph systems are toast, fluid can no longer circulate. Instead, blood and the other bodily fluids pool at the lowest point in the body due to the effects of gravity. As these fluids pool in weird places, their absence in some areas and presence in others cause the weird discoloration that people associate with corpses, liver mortis. The corpse behaves in another strange way, too. It won't move much. I mean, really, it's stiff. If you actually tried to bend the joints of a corpse, which, I mean, that would be totally weird. Why, why would you do that? You'd have to overcome a surprising amount of resistance. After death, the body stiffens and limbs become difficult to manipulate. This is a phenomenon known as rigor mortis, and it actually makes some intuitive sense. Ever tried moving someone else's arm or leg when they've got it bent a certain way? While it takes ATP to make muscles contract, it also takes ATP to make muscles relax. Since ATP is no longer being made in a corpse, well, that's the reason you died at all, to be honest. The muscles cannot relax at all. 
Consequently, they essentially freeze in the positions that they hold. This impedes muscle flexion, and by extension, makes it harder to move a dead body. Despite all these changes that make corpses corpsey, we're still missing the biggest one. Your body is just a bunch of cells, and there are lots of other cellular organisms out there that want to help or harm it. While we're alive, our immune system tries to deal with any nasty organisms that would like to exploit us. When we die, well, it doesn't. This has the most profound effect on what happens to the body. A number of things happen when the immune system shuts down. There are millions of bacteria in our intestinal tract. It's a good thing when we're alive because they help us to absorb nutrients, possibly much more. However, our immune system typically keeps their numbers in check to prevent them from overrunning our body. Once the immune system shuts down, they start to grow out of control and then they start to eat the body from the inside out. As they consume more and more matter, they release gases that become trapped in the abdominal cavity. This causes the positively disgusting condition known as corpse bloat. Normally, I like using illustrations to help show what I'm talking about, but I'm sure you can imagine what corpse bloat is. I've chosen to make this one a bit lighter on the images. Feel free to let me know if you'd rather I don't the next time we talk about this stuff. Then there's the immune system's ally, the skin. It's dead now too, like everything else. New skin cells have stopped being created, but the old dead skin cells on the outer layers of the body, well, those keep flaking away like they always have. As the skin wears thin, the integrity of the outer wall is compromised through microscopic holes. Foreign bacteria enter the body through these tiny holes and start to decompose the body in the same manner that the gut flora does. The immune cells once patrolled the body's vascular system too. This also for bacteria. Now that it's dead, bacteria can use the vascular system as a highway to get to every major organ in the entire body, which they do, and then they start to devour. Typically, the brain is protected from anything bad in the blood, like bacteria, with the blood-brain barrier. But like everything else, this breaks down after death due to a lack of maintenance, which allows contaminants from the now non-sterile vascular system to enter the brain and feast on that delicious brain meat. As foreign bodies enter the brain and start to decompose various cerebral structures, that body is now truly dead, beyond hope. The structures that made it a person have taken physical damage. This process of general putrefaction is what eventually makes revival completely and totally impossible. Before long, you're just dirt and a skeleton. And that's what we know happens when you die. Let's recap real quick. There are three main markers of death. Stopped breathing, stopped heartbeat, and stopped electrical activity in the brain. The first two can sometimes be reversed, but brain death, that's usually it. Once your brain dies, the central nervous system cannot maintain the body, which it usually does, constantly. When the body falls into disrepair, bacteria overwhelm any defenses that remain and consume the soft tissue, eventually leaving nothing but a skeleton. People don't like talking about death, it's true. But if we have conversations like this about what happens to the body, Suddenly, the unknown becomes the known, and it makes it just a little less scary. And death shouldn't be so scary. It's a perfectly natural part of life. It just happens to be the last part of life. We can stave it off for longer, sure. I, I know I certainly won more than 100 years, but we won't win. Plus, without death, life would lose a key part of its meaning. The wonders of our reality could grow stale if we knew that we would have them forever. Instead, we're forced to savor it while it lasts. At any rate, assuming medicine never does find a way to cure death, we're going to have to deal with it. When it comes for you, now that you know what happens, hopefully the finality of it can give you some comfort. In any case, what do you think? Is death really that scary now that you know the mechanics of it? Is it worth keeping at bay as long as possible? And what of consciousness, that part of you that, 
once your brain dies, may be gone forever. As usual, please share your thoughts with me in the comments below. Thanks for watching, as usual, and, uh, well, hope you enjoyed these quickly thrown together videos on my break. Have a good one.